What's going on, everyone? Welcome back to the Trey Thrive Podcast. I'm your host, Tanner, and in today's episode, I am going to talk about what I did to completely revolutionize and transform my business to work for me, kind of like an experiment that I did that actually turned out to work. Stay tuned. The big question you need to ask yourself every day is, do I own a job or do I own a business? And unfortunately, the majority of contractors out there own a job. That's right. They're a slave to their own business. But the other side of the fence is so much greener. It's so much better. And that's when you're finally fully in control of your destiny, your freedom, your time. And that's what Contractor Secrets is about. It's about taking back our time, building a business with systems, standards, values, procedures, putting yourself in the driver's seat. And that's what it's about. So I'm excited. I'm happy to have you here. Let's dive into the Contractor Secrets Podcast. What's up? What's up, everyone? It's Tanner with the Trade Thrive Podcast. And I want to talk to you guys about this revolutionary change that I made in my business. And it really, I credit a lot of it to COVID-19. Um, and I also credit it to the fact that I'm a new father and to the fact that I have this idea and this goal to get out of my business. I think that that should be everyone's goal. And with those three, it kind of gave me the push that I needed to, to get to this point. So I kind of want to outline what's happening inside my own business. And one thing about you know being an owner operator and also trying to coach you guys and help out and mentor and give guidance is I'm learning too. I'm making the same mistakes that you at one point will make and I'm not far away from you. So essentially, I'm not looking back from when I owned a painting business 10 years ago and trying to give you advice on how to operate a painting business now. I do it every day, just like you. Um, and it really, it, it doesn't matter what business you run. It's it's the same. It's, it's It boils down to, um, you know, communication, system, structure, you know, the end result doesn't matter. I'm more concerned about the business owner. Um, so it doesn't matter what you do. You know, the 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 ideals are still the same. So looking back, right, I, I used to run my business this way. I'd have two crews and I've had two crews for a while now. Even when I had one crew, the idea of another crew was scary. And I'm not at this point ready to transition to a third crew. And those of you who don't know, we work in big teams of four and five. So even though we have two crews, we're still able to crank out a ton of work. We average about 85 to 90,000 in uh, produced work per month. Okay. So even with those two crews, we really, we really, you know, get it done. So even when I was back before COVID-19, you know, I was very, very much tied to doing sales. I had to do the sales. Like I remember it was like, I tried to hire a salesperson. It didn't work out. You know, uh, he was, you know, he actually was pretty good, you know, when we did a ride along and, you know, he he was pretty good. And and I was actually really excited about it because, you know, if I have a salesperson that can close, you know, it, it really made things pretty easy for me. But what I realized was, is that he wasn't closing as much as I was. So I had this like comparison thing happening to where I actually kind of got a little scared because I'm like, you know, he needs to close to keep up with the crews. Like we need at least five jobs a week, four to five jobs a week. And he has to make sure that he's hitting that. Um, So the stress kind of was, you know, on him to, you know, hit these goals that I had to keep this machine running that I created. Um, And what it came down to was, is that, you know, not only was that the case, but when he wasn't closing, I found myself doing all the follow-ups, which should have been his responsibility. But, you know, we have automations and things. And again, really just being an owner that wants to step in, you know, I would call these people, negotiate on the phone after he left, and then be forced to pay him uh, eight to 10% commission. I text him at nine o'clock at night saying, Hey, you just made, you know, 400 bucks. And I'm like, this doesn't make sense. This is crazy. You know, so how do I make that change to where like, you know, 10% of the, of the gross was what I agreed on. And that was like a a marker to hit. So it was like 7% was like the bottom line. And then 10% was the top line. You know, and if you're doing 90000 a month and produced revenue, I mean, if you stay with it, I mean, he had a ceiling of nine grand a month. And I'm thinking like, this is crazy. That's a lot to give a salesperson, especially if I'm 
providing all the leads. I'm uh, giving him the tools that he needs and I'm helping him with follow-ups and we have automation. So my automation family out there, the guys that have signed up with automations for me with me, you guys know they're getting, they're getting follow-ups. They're getting like, they're getting things like his job's so easy. Show up. You have a company with a phenomenal reputation. I mean, and your leads are ready to go. These were home advisor leads at the time. And those of you who know home advisor leads are normally ready to go if you can get in front of them. So, I mean, it, it was like, it just didn't make sense. And I'm like, how do I incentivize a salesperson to want to take on this role? I'm not, I can't pay 10%, but I have to make it to where a good salesperson would be excited. So like there was this thing that I had to figure out, right? In sales, like I talk about production with you guys a lot about getting out of production, but you know, what happens when you're ready to get out of sales? And that's where I was early this year. And, you know, early this year, I had to figure out, what what am I going to do here? Like I am working all day long. I mean, I was doing five to six estimates a day. I mean, driving like crazy. The mileage I put on my Honda Accord in two years, I got the car with 40,000 miles. It has 210,000. Okay. I mean, I drove like you would not believe. I wasn't at the jobs. I'm, I'm used to not being at the jobs because I would always be doing estimates. And I had to think like, what am I going to do here? You know, like, what am I going to do? Because like, this is taking up way too much of my time. Like, seriously, I couldn't even like breathe. Like I'd come home so tired from driving all day. And then no, not even to mention the safety factor of driving. I know you guys know what I'm talking about. I'm not like crazy here. I mean, I'd be texting on the road. I'd be calling on the road. I mean, it, it was dangerous, right? I mean, like all day, you know? So not to mention I was eating horribly. I mean, just going into like random places and like, you know, just not having time to pack lunch. And when I did pack lunch, it was just like, you know, you guys get it. Those of you who are in your car right now are probably doing what I was doing. You know, I, I get it. So I had to make the transition. So what I did was, and, and this is partially due to COVID, right? So when COVID hit, those of you know, I'm a new father, Malia is my baby girl, um, wanted to be safe, wanted to be cautious. So I did not want to leave the house to go do estimates because I'm like, great, you know, I got this thing going on. I'm not bringing home anything to my daughter. So what I did was for the first month was strictly virtual estimating. So virtual estimating was interesting because I had already had a system for estimating. And when I boiled down the estimating process, I said, okay, when I go to someone's house, again, those of you who have followed me with my sales advice, it's 5% pricing, 95% presentation, 95% building a relationship, 95% communicating. So I said, okay, the pricing is the reason why in most cases, I thought I had to go to the house to get the measurements, right? To measure the wall space. But for all of my interiors, all I would do is go on Zillow and look up the square footage. And if they didn't want a room, I'd just ask what that square footage, if that room was, or I'd subtract it, and I'd figure out a, a way. I, guys, people don't care how you come up with the price. You should show something that obviously states where you got the price from, square footage, linear footage, area circumference, I don't know, whatever you use, but they don't care. You just want to, they just want to see the bottom line price homeowners. You're not working with general contractors, big transition. You need to make mentally. If you've done that before, you know, if you work for a contractor and a homeowner, contractors want to see details. They want to see, you know, labor hours and all that garbage that I, I there's don't even, I, I, that's a, that's for a different podcast. I'm talking about homeowners. They just want to see a price. Okay. They have a budget mind. They want to see a price. They don't care. So I, I kind of thought, all right, fine. I don't have to go to the houses. Cool. So I could just do virtual estimates. So I'm like, all right. I put together pretty much a Facebook automation. And this automation would get a lead from Facebook and then walk them through a virtual estimate process. Name, phone number, address, email. What kind of project? Oh, interior. How much square footage? Great. Great. Really, if you actually go through the home advisor process of what it would be on a consumer side, that's what they do. They take all the information. Now they're asking for square footage because they had to transition too for someone to be able to give a virtual estimate. So everyone had to make the shift. 
So what was good about it was that I was doing them and people were cool with it because they're like, okay, great. We don't want to contact. We want, we don't want contact either, you know, or we want to limit contact too. It was great because the market was cool with it. A year ago, if all you did was offer virtual estimates, uh, they'd be like, all right, that's weird. Like you don't want to come out to my house. Like, so there was an opportunity here that had not been available previously for the market to say, okay, I'm cool with this. Fine. Even, even playing field. All right. Because other guys are doing it too. Kind of. So it was cool. They were cool with it. But the key was, is that I would call them and I would build a relationship on the phone. So I'm in my office now and I'm calling them and I'm asking the same questions that I would had I been there, which was cool because I still felt that connection. I'd make the same jokes I'd make. I'd show my personality a little bit. I build value as much as I could. Whether I'm on the phone or in person, you're going to hear me build value, make jokes and communicate. So I, I, it's all about that connection, right? You know, if you just do a virtual estimate, send the quote, shut off the podcast, pull over, okay, and, and sit for 10 minutes and decide why are you in business? Because you have to understand that in business, it's all about communication. It's all about relationships, communication, relationships, communication, relationships, communication, relationships. Next time you find yourself blowing through an estimate, blowing through an, an, you know, uh, an engagement with a customer, okay, realize that you wasted your time going there. You have to go through the channels every single time. You know, you think about it, the Patriots, all right, Patriots. I use them as an example because they're exemplary, all right? Every time they, they go to a football game, you know they're not going to blow it. They go through the channels. They go through the motions. Peyton Manning, any, any Peyton Manning fans out there? This guy would sit there and do a cadence for the whole, the whole play clock. I mean, all the way down until, you know, the, the last second, the guy. I mean, I remember being a kid thinking like, you know, or, or even so, like, I remember playing Madden and playing against Peyton Manning. And the Peyton Manning was the computer. And they would literally take him down all the way to the one second before he'd snap the ball. I'd be like, man, it took forever. I just want to play the game. But he was going through his channels, even in the video game. But he was going through his channels for a reason. He had a set way to do things. And it gave him the best results for success. If he went up and just rushed it because he didn't feel like it, he didn't feel like checking the defense and calling out the audibles, right? If he didn't feel like it, well, chances are probably through an interception. But if he went through his channels and he took his time and he asked the right questions and he communicated effectively, right, to his team, see see how that works? So when you enter into a sales engagement, don't blow and go. You have to sit there and go through the channels. Don't rush through it. You know, asking about their dog is just as important as asking for the sale, Okay. People would prefer to buy from their friends than they would a stranger. Simple psychology. Trust. It starts with the trust. So anyway, going back to where we were with, you know, the the virtual estimating, the process, getting back into that. Okay, I want to talk to you about what the what the transition was, what the what the motivation was, okay, for me to do this was essentially I had to get out of the field doing these estimates. I mean, it was crazy. And yes, you do run into people that waste your time. I'm not saying that everyone is like, cool, even when we pre-qualify. You know, I had a lady I gave a $10,000 estimate to the other day. And after I gave her that estimate, I mean, the house was massive. You know, I mean, a beautiful home. Every bit of $10,000, okay, for this paint job. You know, there's, I mean, I, I didn't even feel bad, like, putting out that quote for her. Um, messages me back and asked me what it would be to paint the fascia board on the barn would be after I did that. I'm like what? There's this little face. I didn't even charge for this fascia board on the barn. I just said, I'll throw it in for free. And she said, well, what would it be just to do the fascia board on the barn? I said, what in my head? I wish I could have just said that in person. Wasn't my customer tire kicker. I mean, are you serious? You just, what? I mean, so anyway, you have those people and it's like that drive time and those people, like I couldn't stand it. It happened to me back then. It happened to me at that time. So I had to figure something out. So we're doing the virtual estimates. They're going great. Okay. I'm selling jobs virtually, getting us through COVID-19. Okay. My team can't believe it because, you know, everyone's panicking, but we, we didn't go one day without work. I mean, it was phenomenal. It's great. I planned it perfectly. 
Okay, but I started transitioning to virtual estimates. I'm making sure my wife is happy, and I know also I'm making sure that I'm keeping my family safe and healthy during that time, and I'm also able to do my job, which at one point I thought was impossible. So those of you who are in the field painting or doing any sort of trade that requires you to physically be actually performing the task, at your level, you're thinking – it's impossible for me to leave this this area and do something else. That's what I thought about sales, but I had to make that uncomfortable transition. I look, I saw the opportunity and I took it. You know, the opportunity for you would be you see that that team member that can hold themselves to a high standard and take care of business. That's your opportunity to get out and let that person take over that role and then get into the sales role. And then once you master that sales role, then you follow suit with what I'm telling you to do, which would be to eliminate yourself from that position. So how did I overcome the commission thing? Okay. Because it didn't make sense. Two crews, you know, 90,000. If I had a third crew that I had to keep busy and we were doing well over, you know, 1.2 million. um, if, If I had that third crew to take care of and that salesperson was literally that that person that could you know close the deals keep guys busy i get it commission is well deserved well earned i understand and that would fit well within our budget but i don't need to do that right now i still have my two crews i'm happy with our profit margin how do i figure out how to get someone out there my project manager is phenomenal he's such a good guy great guy i mean he's on it he's one of those people that you just hope to have for in your business does what he's does what he's told on time respectful presentable customers love him that guy okay and he's my ace which at one point he wasn't he was actually just somebody i hired as a painter and really showed out in terms of his ability to manage and just you know sometimes he freaks out about things but you know that happens but 99 percent of the time he's on you know so i trust him and that is a role that, you know, at one point I thought, you know, he's good. He's, he's never been a salesperson before. I don't think he'd be a very good fit for this. How do I make this work? So with the idea that the virtual estimates were working, I decided to take him and put him in a position to facilitate the virtual estimates. So what he would do now, and this is what he does now currently, it's working great, is he goes to all the estimates now that things are back to normal. And although I could go back out there and do these estimates, I like my new role in the office, marketing, you know, on the phone, pumping out quotes. I like that new role enough to where for me, it's like I am removed from my business. I don't go to the jobs and I don't do the estimates. At that point in time, I am now ready to go. Like I'm good. So I have this like oversight happening. I have a sales system. I have a production system. You know, and I do answer the phone still. A lot of you guys ask me, like, who answers my phones? I do answer the phone. I think the phone is one of the most important aspects of the business. And I really only get about three to four calls a day to where it's so it's not that big of a deal. I don't really feel the need to pay someone. I have automations following up with people, following up with quotes. Um, you know, the scheduling's automated. So it's like I really have, I would say, maximized everything. I mean, everything. The only role I have in the business is answering phones and sending quotes and following up. I do follow up. I like to be the person to follow up. So I'm still in that, I would say that role, which could be replaced at one point, but I have the time now and I'm not driving 6,000 miles a month. So his role now is to take pictures. He goes to the jobs, uploads the pictures, goes to the estimates, uploads the pictures into Trello. Trello is great. If you're not using Trello, this is not an ad for Trello. It's free. So Trello is awesome because it's cloud-based, okay? And if he uploads a picture, I can see it on my end, super easy, and we create a card for each lead. Um, So when he goes there and I have a tab that has his estimates, so I could just go into his estimates, and I give him a form to fill out. The form is my three questions. Those of you who know my sales process, I want to know these three questions. You know, what's the story? Why are we painting? When do you want the job done? Have you chosen colors? Okay, pretty simple. Now, with that information, I also have him ask one more important question. What's one thing you learned about the homeowner not related to painting? And that encourages him to get to know the person. So, you know, he'll say, oh, this person was a military veteran who lost his whatever. This is a person who um, she, she she's really close with her daughter 
or this is a person that, you know, she really loves her plants. Okay. With that information, now I have my three questions. I have this little thing that maybe they didn't know that we were paying attention to, but we now have a note on and I'm actually calling them. And for a lady that he writes something like the plant thing, I'd be like, oh, okay. Hey, Mrs. Jones, my name's Tanner. So the first thing I'm doing after he leaves and when I'm ready to do the quote, say, hey, Mrs. Jones, my name's Tanner uh, with Premium Painting. I just wanted to first ask you, how did Chris do? And I want to know what, he, you know, what, what was the, what was that like? Oh, he did great. I said, did he answer all your questions? Okay, awesome. And then I reiterate the scope. I say, okay, cool. So I just want to, you know, verify the scope with you. Scope is, okay, we're doing, you know, front door garage door, you know, walls, trim, no soffits, right? Yeah. We don't want to do the soffits. Okay, great. So one thing I just wanted to make sure that you knew is I don't know if, you know, anyone else has told you that they're going to do this, but we are actually really, um, focus on the prep work. So we're going to put plastic everywhere. Most importantly, uh, I saw some pictures of your beautiful garden. We're going to make sure that we cover those, uh, beautiful plants with plastic. Okay. Right then and there. Like, so think about it on the customer side, you have this Guy that comes, he's presentable, he asks questions, he sees the job, he puts a face to the business, and then you get a follow-up from somebody else, you know, seamlessly asking, you know, just verifying the scope, building more value, and getting ready to submit the proposal. So I'll say this, I'll be like, okay, awesome, I have the whole scope. First, I just want to thank you for giving us an opportunity. Um, Chris said you were wanting it done a little bit sooner than later. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to send you a quote here and um, you know, if you have any questions at all, please let me know. You can email back, text back or whatever works for you. Okay. So I'll send the quote and then I'll jump into my quoting application and I'll see if she opened it. I'll wait about an hour and I'll follow up within that hour. Cause I want to know what the objections are. So I'll call and I'll say, Hey, I just wanted to just double check that you received the quote. I know she received the quote. I could see it, but they don't know that I can see it. And nine times out of 10, you know, they're actually they're surprisingly honest. Some people I would think would be like, no, I didn't see it yet and try to avoid me. Right. But I can totally see, like tell that they opened it and you know, they're like, yeah, I did see it. I did see it. And based off of their response there. Okay. Now I'm like, all right, so which direction am I heading here? So if it's like, oh yeah, I saw it. Everything looked great, which happens one out of like 10, you know, and they say it just like that. But then you have people that say, oh, okay, yeah, I saw it. You know, we're going to get a couple more estimates. Why? You know, right? W what was the budget? Where, you know, and then you get into your objections and then you overcome those objections and you give yourself the best chance to sell the job. So I'm doing the best part of what I was doing. Like the driving wasn't efficient for me. Going to the estimates and taking, you know, pictures and measurements wasn't efficient for me. What I'm best at is that time period between when they receive the quote and they hire us for the job. That little period of time is where I've now narrowed down my entire focus and it's more efficient for me, 100%. I'm in the office every day, which is great for me. As much as I'd love to be driving 6,000 miles a month, I'll pass. So that is the revolutionary change that I made in my business because of COVID-19, because of some strategic, strategic things in terms of the role that I created. So we have two teams of four. We have one guy just move on to another company, not a painting company, um, just a better opportunity for him. So, and I'm going to keep it this way, two teams of four with one uh, supervisor, quote unquote, which is Chris. And he's actually responsible for the estimates, which I only, I only schedule him estimates after 12 o'clock. So 12 to five is wide open for estimates every week, which has worked out great. You know, unless somebody really needs a morning, I'll make it work, but that works out. And in the morning, I jockey him to the job that needs the most help to keep us on schedule. So he has a painting role and an estimating role every day, full, no matter what. So even if we don't have estimates, that was another thing when I had a, a salesperson to be like days where there wasn't any estimates. What does that guy do? Just sit? You know, oh, go market. Yeah, okay. You know, I mean, it just, it, it's hard, right? So that is what I suggest. You find that role. And that's what you probably do as an owner. You help out in the field and then you go and you take the essence. But create that role within your company with an employee because then again, you're, you're not, you know, you're, you're creating that balance without the stress of keeping a salesperson busy. Now, if you're exceeding 1.2 million and you're hitting these crazy numbers in terms of, production and you're doing over 40 estimates a, a month, okay, then that is the time where you hire a full-time salesperson with commission. But until that point, this role can work out great for you and it'll free you 
You know, and that's the goal. It's freedom. That's the whole purpose of this podcast. That's what's in the intro. I want to get you out of your own business. So hopefully you got something out of this. So I am ready to announce that there is something big coming. If you've listened to this whole thing, you're you're in for a treat. Well, not really because I'm not going to give it up, but we got something big coming, guys. Um, it should be released next month, and it is September 16th right now. Actually, one month from today, 30 days out. Uh, we got something big coming, um, and it's going to change the contracting industry forever. So I'm so excited about it. I've had to be quiet about it for two years. So this is probably the first time you've heard me say it. Um, if you're listening to this, you will be one of the first ones to know through the podcast is when I'm going to announce how you can see it, um, check it out. I can't really go into much detail, but it's going to be great. So I hope you're excited. It's going to really change the contracting game. And I'm excited to spearhead the initiative here. I mean, this has been a dream of mine for a long time, longer than I've been in the painting business, which is crazy. I don't even know. It's like a vision I got so long ago because my dad was a painter. So I kind of knew the business from the outside looking in. So it was just something that I've always had a dream to do. And that dream is going to be coming to life here soon. And, uh, you know, I'm so excited to uh, get it out to you guys. So you'll be hearing a lot about that. Definitely. As soon as it. (laughs) As soon as that time comes, hopefully I don't annoy anybody, but it's just going to be pure excitement. You guys rock. Thanks for spending the time with me today. I know this was longer than normal, but I hope that you were able to peek inside some of the things I got going on in my business, give you some ideas for yours, keep growing, keep, you know, keep, keep it going, you know, um, real quick, you know, a little bit of an ad here, guys, you know, we do websites, um, automations and Facebook ads. So if any of those three things are of any interest to you, let's jump on a phone call, talk about it, see if we're a good fit for you. All right. Thanks so much. We'll see you on the next episode. Hey, I just want to take a second to thank you for joining me here on the Contractor Secrets Podcast. Um, I'm just going to take this opportunity to let you know that my passion is coaching people, helping people. Um, I've changed my Instagram name to at contractor coach. And I did that because that is my passion. I want to help you. So please reach out to me. If you have an issue going on in your business, send me an email, find me on Instagram, message me, and let's do a breakthrough session. I want to work through your problems in your business to help you get to that next level. And and one thing that I always say is this, you know, the difference between those that get over the humps and the hurdles in business is just a change in perspective. And that's what I plan to offer you. So Get with me, message me, allow me to help you take your business to the next level.